director of the university's Office of Sustainability and lecturer in the High Meadows Environmental Institute, and Claire White, Associate Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering in the Anglinger Center. Hi there. Uh, Jesse, thank you for joining us. And I wanna talk about the Princeton Net Zero America study. At a time when some folks may have heard of this idea of the need to get to net zero emissions or zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, but aren't steeped in the details of how we could get there, could you discuss what you were exploring in your different scenarios? Yeah, so the Net Zero America study was a major two-year effort here at Princeton to try to chart out several different pathways that the United States could take as a whole to get to this critical goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions. That's the point where human-caused greenhouse gas emissions are offset fully or even greater than that um, by, by human-caused activities that draw down atmospheric CO2 emissions. So we're at a point where we're no longer contributing to, green, to global warming. Um, or to, to atmospheric increases in, in greenhouse gas emissions at that point. That's not the end of the challenge, but that's a critical goal to get to um, as we try to stabilize global warming and to stave off the worst effects of climate change. And so what we wanted to do was take a look at this goal, which had been uh, increasingly part of the public vernacular uh, commitments being set by uh, major corporations, by uh, state uh, and, and federal national jurisdictions, and really look at what it actually takes to do that, to get to net zero emissions across the entire economy. Um, and to do that with a degree of granularity that we hadn't seen before, right? To really try to understand what does this mean for what we have to build around the country, you know, in, in different states and different communities, uh, when and where, um, and how is that gonna reshape uh, the way we make and use energy? Um, so we charted out several different paths. I think none of them are probably the path we will take, but they help us understand our options. Um, and the ways that we can get to net zero. And we found you know, an exciting way that all of these pathways are affordable. Um, we can reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions in the US by mid-century without spending more as a share of our national wealth or gross domestic product on energy services than we do today or have historically in recent prosperous periods. And so that's really good news. Like the cost is not a principal barrier anymore thanks to improvements in innovation in clean energy technologies. Um, now, the challenge, though, is that the transformation of our energy system is quite unprecedented. And so it requires focus on the kinds of things we need to build, the level of capital that we have to mobilize, the policy environment that we need to have in place to get that done, um, and really the trade-offs that we're going to face and choices we have to make as a country about the types of impacts we're okay with, the benefits that we want to see uh, as we make this transition. And so that's what we were, trying, what to we're trying to provide with the study was a window into those kinds of choices. And could you talk, one thing that I was really interested in is I think when people talk about this transition to net zero, they, they think of, you know, we're going to be all renewable, that we're going to have a radical, you know, transformation over the next, you know, three, you know, three decades. Yeah. And you really looked at a bunch of very different paths. So could you maybe, you know, compare and contrast if you give, give folks a sense of the different mm -hmm. ways the U.S. could transition? Yeah, there's sort of, I think, three main axes that we looked at to kind of construct. We constructed five scenarios and they collectively span three kind of pretty big uh, decision points or pretty big options that we face. The first is how much we rely on electrification of uh, transportation and heating in buildings, which are two big sources of greenhouse gas emissions today that are reliant on fossil fuels. And if we electrify those sources of energy uh, demand, we can both make them more efficient because those processes are more efficient than internal combustion engines or boilers. And we can also shift that fuel demand onto electricity for which we have a bunch of different low carbon substitutes available from wind and solar power to nuclear power or geothermal energy or others. Um, so that's the kind of first big question is how far are we gonna push electrification? And we had scenarios where that kind of went all the way to you know everybody driving electric vehicles by 2050 uh, to more modest scenarios where the uptake of those technologies was more uh, moderate, maybe 50 or 60% penetration. The second aspect was how much are we gonna rely on bioenergy? One of the ways that we can produce fuels without net emissions to, to the, uh, of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere is to use biomass or bioenergy where we grow crops or use residue from agricultural or forestry products where the plants absorb CO2 from the atmosphere while they grow and they convert that we can convert that CO2 into hydrocarbon fuels that we could use to substitute for transportation fuels or for heating fuels or to produce hydrogen which is a carbon free fuel right when we burn it hydrogen produces no CO2 emissions and actually take the CO2 that was absorbed in that plant growth and sequester it underground in safe geologic storage 
that produces a negative emissions process, right? Because we're taking CO2 from the atmosphere and, and it ends up in the ground. And that uh, negative emissions would actually allow us to continue to use some amount of fossil energy um, in the most hard to abate or expensive sectors like jet fuel. Uh, and then the third question is how much are we going to rely on wind and solar power, which are the most cost effective ways we have to produce clean uh, electricity, uh, but they're variable. And so there's some limits on, on how much we can rely on them. And they have very significant land area impacts across the country. So we have to think carefully about siting them, where we want to build these resources, what the transmission grid needs to look like to accommodate them. And so we looked at scenarios that were 100 percent renewable powered and ones that had much more constrained um, deployment of wind and solar. And so that's kind of the space that we have to navigate within. And the good news is all of those pathways get the job done, but the costs and benefits and trade-offs are very different. Got it. And so uh, the net zero by 2050 is a goal that, for example, President Biden is mm -hmm. committed to. We'll see within a matter of days, kind of at least his initial slice of what we would do between now and 2030 to get there. Now, he's obviously given some initial indications of how the United States could pursue this through his infrastructure plan, but he's clearly you know, shied away from, for example, explicitly putting a price on carbon in order to achieve that goal. And I'm wondering if you could just speak broadly about what your research and those of your collaborators says about to what extent we can make that target without putting a nationwide price on carbon. Yeah, so I think the Net Zero America study was uh, meant to offer a really a, a technical blueprint uh, for how we can get the job done rather than a policy manual. And so we were pretty agnostic about the policy drivers needed to get the job. Instead, we tried to presented the report as the policymakers to do list. We have a particular graphic in the report, which is, you know, we're focused on 2050, but really those decisions are far off. What we need to know is what we have to do now to get on that track. And so we focused a lot on the report on what the implications are for the next 10 years. Uh, which is the window that we really can shape with current decisions. And we have a graphic in the report that shows all of the incremental investment that needs to be leveraged into various clean energy technologies and sectors in the next decade, above and beyond what would happen with current policies. And so that's exactly what the policymakers need to do, right? There's all these boxes of investment in clean energy and in, in transmission expansion, in electric vehicles, in demonstrating new technologies like biomass gasification or carbon capture or hydrogen production. Um, and we need to make those investments now um, and they're not going to happen without policy. And so it sort of zeroes in on what you need to get, uh, do to get the job done. It's a total of about $2.5 trillion in incremental capital investment. Now, that's not a cost. It's an investment. Right. And we pay that cost back over many years in lower fuel costs and, you know, in our electricity bills over time. Um, but we do have to get that money moving. Right. We have to get the, the, the capital investment made. And if you look at the scale of the and scale and scope of the Biden uh, American Jobs Plan, it's clear that they were at least, if not paying attention to our report, I think they were, but to broader a broader set of reports as well that point to similar needs because the scale of investment in that directed towards clean energy is about a trillion dollars. And if you think that every dollar of public spending might leverage a dollar or two of private spending, then you're in the right ballpark in terms of magnitude. And they really did try, if you go through the bill to, you know, try to address or try the plan, it's not a bill yet, but the plan, they really did try to address each of the key um, sectors. So there's issues on clean electricity, on electric vehicle adoption and manufacturing, on expanding the transmission grid, on energy efficient buildings and electrification. Um, so really go down the line on, on uh, promoting carbon capture and sequestration, hydrogen demonstration projects, really a whole range of them. And so I'm, I'm heartened to see that, that, you know, it really was a pretty comprehensive effort. Um, and there's a lot of policies that can get those things done. A price on carbon would be a powerful tool across the whole economy, but it's also one that has been very politically difficult to implement. And so in a moment where we're thinking about climate policy as part of a core economic agenda and a set of investments in job creation, that may ultimately have a better political chance than a, a large price on carbon. But we'll see what happens in the next Congress. Got it. Um, excellent. So I just want to see if one, we're about to transition, but one quick question, is there one spot that you found that you feel like, for example, you could put up, expand wind and solar that people hadn't thought of that when you look at your roadmap, it seems like this is something people haven't thought of that's really an opportunity. Yeah, I mean, there are areas in the country that have not seen a whole lot of wind and solar development yet that might in the longer term, given the, just the cumulative amount of the scale that we need to build out on. I think the thing that sh maybe shocks most people is that we put these maps together of where wind and solar would be built across the country and just how extensive it is. We're talking about, you know, wind and solar going from about 10 percent of our electricity supply today to as much as half by 2030. 
and um, 70 or 80% of a much larger electricity system by 20, uh, 2050. And so it's just a huge rollout of this new infrastructure across the country. And that means a lot of job creation, a lot of revenue for you know rural counties and elsewhere, but also a lot of challenges in figuring out where we wanna build these resources that don't impact um, you know, too much of our quality of life. Thanks so much. Next, we are gonna talk with Claire White, but before that, let's take a look at the first of four videos produced by the university's Office of Sustainability of how Princeton is using the campus as a lab to demonstrate environmental research in action. Can we, as a society, reduce our carbon emissions to the point that we need to? As an engineer, my answer is yes, of course, we can. I am solidly convinced we have the technology, we have the ability. Do we have the social will to? That's a really difficult question. We're here today with Ted Bohr, Energy Plant Manager at Princeton University, to talk about the university's new goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions on campus. By 2020, we're going to get our carbon footprint down to the same level it was in 1990. This sounds like it should be easy, but the university has expanded its size by one and a half times, and we've actually added a lot of air conditioning and other loads in that period of time. The university has a second goal that is much more ambitious, and that is to get our total carbon footprint down to net zero by year 2046. You know, in really simple terms, I think of it as essentially not burning anything or not having anything burned on our behalf, essentially no combustion. Just like at your house, first you want to reduce use, and then you want to deliver energy as efficiently as possible, and then you want to make that energy with renewable sources. We're going to do the same thing on a campus scale here. One of the things that's very important is to have energy storage. What we're doing on campus right now is we're drilling a series of wells. We're building a geo-exchange system where we take heat from the buildings and instead of rejecting it through a cooling tower to cool off the campus, we'll reject it to the rock underneath the campus. The water will be cooled off by the rock in the ground. The rock eventually will get warmer and warmer all summer. Then I've got thousands and tens of thousands of cubic yards of warmer rock as a resource that we can use for heating the campus all winter. What is amazing from my seat right now is seeing that the university can fully do this. We have the ability to get our carbon footprint down to zero. We actually know how to do this and we have the technology. It's not that we need to invent anything new. It exists today. And I am very excited. Essentially, what we need is permission. Even the funding, if we kept doing the business as usual, we would actually spend more over the life of the new systems than if we built the new systems. Princeton has the almost unique opportunity to lead by example. So even in the actions of our facilities, other people are going to look at us and say, wow, now that I see that Princeton has done that, I get it. I don't need to take exactly the same steps that Princeton did, but I can follow Princeton's thought process and I can make steps forward and I can reduce my own carbon footprint as well. We can influence thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of others by example. with Claire White, Associate Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the Englinger Center for, the Ener for Energy and the Environment. Welcome, Claire. Thanks. I think one of the most stunning Thanks. statistics I've learned through your work is the fact that cement is the second most used resource after water when measured by volume. Could you talk a little about how it pervades our built environment and why demand is growing and what that means for climate change? Sure. So in terms of how much concrete we use around the world, it is astronomical, um, as you mentioned. And this all just comes from the need for infrastructure, like roads and bridges, and also for things such as development of cities, skyscrapers, all of this. Um, and so because the world's population is increasing, there's a never-ending need for more construction to occur. Um, and so because of 
uh, prevalent use of concrete, um, we need to make, uh, well, what we use nowadays is based on cement powder. And when we manufacture the cement powder, we actually have CO2 emissions that come from those plants. Um, so if you look at the amount of CO2 that's anthropogenically uh, created, the cement industry is uh, about seven to eight percent of all anthropogenic CO2 emissions. Right. And so um, it sounds like alkali activated cement is a lower carbon alternative, but there are still some questions about its durability. Can you describe what are what are some of the issues and how you're tackling that? Yeah, sure. Okay. So um, this is one of the areas of research that my group focuses on. Um, it's, it's a different type of concrete. Uh, it doesn't rely on the cement powder that I just talked about. Um, but because it's, uh, it's got, uh, well, we use different um, starting materials to make it, um, it has uh, sometimes slightly different performance. So we need to understand how that performance is going to uh, last over the years. Um, and so therefore we do a lot of research in terms of trying to understand if the material is gonna degrade, how does it degrade so that we can predict long-term how it's gonna perform. Um, and so this is just one of the alternative types of concrete that people are working on around the world as a way of making the uh, concrete industry more sustainable. And this is also in addition to a lot of approaches that um, are being researched and implemented that are based on the traditional concrete that we use nowadays. And when you look at the cement industry and what it's doing, I mean, one thing that's interesting is I think, you know, again, and the public perception, the coal industry has been a target for some time. Obviously, people uh, associate transportation uh, with greenhouse gas emissions, but cement is something that's not covered nearly in as depth, but, but is now, you know, certainly getting some attention from, for example, policymakers who are looking at, you know, sourcing and things like that. What, what do you see happening within the cement industry? And to what extent is there a possibility for, you know, say near-term change, even while you're looking at these really long-term solutions? Yeah, that's a really good question. What, what um, well, in the past, the, uh, there's two industries that have been very hard to decarbonize, one of which is the cement industry, and the other is of which is the steel industry, which is a whole other can of worms. Um, together, they account for 15% of all anthropogenic CO2 emissions. So um, in the past, people have really kind of said, it's too hard to decarbonize these industries. Um, let's focus on, on where we can make more of an impact in terms of reducing CO2 emissions. But as you were saying, it's, it's been recently that people have started to say, hey, we need to look at these industries and we need to be careful in terms of the emissions and how we can reduce them. So there is a really big push happening at the moment in the cement industry to um, assess ways in which the CO2 emissions can be reduced. Um, these uh, range from making the kilns that are used to make uh, the cement more energy efficient to implementing carbon capture and storage technology on the cement kilns. Um, and so there's roadmaps that are being created to show what kind of reductions could be achieved over the decades to come based on these kind of uh, technologies. And so these combined with the alternative types of cements that um, are not included in these reports so much just because they're relatively new um, and the cement industry has been based on uh, the, the same stuff for 150 years. Trying to bring in an alternative type of concrete does take some time, but it's imperative that we start really doing a lot of research on them um, and implementing the technology to have an even bigger impact on reducing CO2 emissions. And what surprised you about cement as you've dug into it? I mean, you're dealing with atoms, right? And, and kind of it's the very basis of it. Is it are, are there things that as you've, you've been breaking it down and figuring out how to, in some ways, re-engineer it that you wouldn't have anticipated or that you've been struck by? I mean, that's a very good question. Um, <laughs> So when it comes uh, to the research that we're doing, I would say it's one of the most complex materials you could ever work on. There is so much going on in terms of concrete. Why, why is that? Why is it so? 
Um, there's uh, what we call different phases. Um, different phases give different properties. They're not nice and ordered. They're disordered. So trying to understand what they look like is very confusing. Um, and so because of this, um, a lot of the uh, uh, improvements that have happened in the past, like decades ago, are more empirical. Um, whereas nowadays, what we can do and what I'm excited by is we understand the fundamentals now. We can look at these complex uh, systems, understand what's happening in them, and then we can tweak them to make uh, to have better performance at the larger length scale. And so I would say that that's something, as I've gone through the research, that I've found really re rewarding is using the fundamental research to make uh, big implications at a larger length scale. And when you're working on something like this, as, as, as I understand it, you know, the fruits of your labor might not be realized for decades, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about truly long-term solutions. How do you, you know, how do you conceptualize attacking this, this problem and, and what are kind of benchmarks along the way that would give you a sense of whether you're making progress? So there's always um, comparison to the concrete we use nowadays in terms of its performance. So that's how like, you can um, compare and get a sense of um, how, how the material is going. Um, and then also I think it's, it's thinking about, okay, as we move forward, what kind of resources can, are available that we can use to make alternative types of concrete? Um, and can we further our understanding on those systems so that when say we are ready for deployment, um, uh, we, we know it can be large scale and it can um, therefore have a, a big impact when it comes to reducing CO2 emissions. Is there, a, you know, when you're doing these, these tests and then obviously things are happening in the field, but for example, is there one part of the built environment that you could say that probably would be most amenable to switching to an alternative concrete in the in the near term is, is there a place that you think about in that in that sense yeah I mean we use concrete so prevalently throughout um, uh, infrastructure I would say that the the kind of places to start would be for sidewalks um, sewer systems these kinds of applications um, people have used alternative cements in high-rise applications. There are buildings around the world that are based on alternative cements. It's just they haven't really taken off in the past um, for large-scale use because often they're a little bit more costly up front. And there's been no imperative in terms of uh, for sustainability until recently. So um, there's a lot of uh, low-hanging fruit in terms of construction where these alternative cements um, could first be used. Thank you so much, Claire. Next with us, we'll have Forrest Meggers just after this break to hear about the university's stormwater management efforts. We'll be right back. The natural process was that stormwater would fall on some open space and it would infiltrate into the ground. What's happened is that because we've got so many impervious surfaces, we've got buildings, we've got parking lots, we've got roads, we've got sidewalks, the stormwater doesn't have a place to go. My name is Natalie Shivers. I am the Associate University Architect for Planning at Princeton. Our goal is to improve the overall health of the watershed. Every project that we do, every major capital project, and I would say every minor capital project, will be planned to meet our campus stormwater goals. So far, as part of the 2016 campus plan, we have bought 100 acres of the campus into what we call enhanced stormwater management or ecological stormwater management. Our goal for 2046 is 222 acres to be managed in an ecologically sustainable way. We've had many episodes of flooding in the past, both localized and you know, kind of larger scale, and by providing opportunities to infiltrate stormwater into the campus, that really helps to improve the resilience of the campus in large storm events. So the Washington Road Stream Restoration is located between Faculty Road to the south and to the north, the area of Stryker Bridge. That's where the stream daylight 
And rather than just put the stream in a pipe, which was kind of the old-fashioned solution, we decided to restore the natural meander of the stream, restore the floodplain, and improve the biohabitat of the area. We're seeing tangible results. What we can see is that there's a lot less erosion, so less sediment going into the stream, less sediment going into the lake. We see that there are healthier streams in terms of micro and macro invertebrates, and we're seeing that we're getting beautiful landscapes as a kind of byproduct of the stormwater management strategies that we're employing. We are looking at the outfalls into Lake Carnegie and measuring the quality of the water, the velocity of the water, the quantity of the water that goes out of those outfalls into the lake. And then we will start to monitor as projects come online and understand what their impact is on the the quality of the watershed. It is the number one water quality challenge in New Jersey that so many toxins and so many pollutants are being carried into our streams and lakes and so managing our stormwater runoff is really important to preserve the health of the watershed. I'm glad to welcome to the conversation, Assistant Professor of Architecture in the Anglinger Center and Co-Director of the Program in Architect and Engineering, Forrest Vengers. Welcome, Forrest. Thanks, Julia. You've said, you said, ultimately, we hope to be, we hope to be able to stop just conditioning rooms and start to condition people to be comfortable. What does that mean exactly? Well, uh, we've talked a lot about the upstream challenges of carbon emissions and these enormous sectors that are generating these massive problems that we face today. But at the end of the day, it's really us uh, at the very end of the line that are generating them. And uh, one of the things that generates that is our need for amenities. And one of the main amenities we all expect to have is a room that feels good to us as we sit here and do our jobs now, mostly on Zoom. Um, But one of the things I research is the fact that that paradigm of what feels good to us actually has a lot of nuances that we don't take advantage of in terms of how we design heating and cooling systems, how we design the infrastructure that surrounds us. And we've kind of accepted a lot of standard practices um, that if in changing them, we can help drive towards some of those goals that, that Jesse was talking about. And even on the material side toward, toward new ways that we can engage with our, our surroundings and the built infrastructure uh, that contain us in our so-called comfortable environments. <laughs> Got it. And so, and could you give an example of, for example, uh, you know, one way in which we might change our conception of what it means to work in a normal office environment that could actually translate into a significant, say, you know, climate solution. Sure. Um, I can start with the Jimmy Carter demonstration here. It's the take off your jacket. Um, But I do that only because uh, now I have short sleeves on um, and there's this whole phenomenon that occurs between you and your surroundings that doesn't have to do with the air temperature. So sure, it's great that my arms are now more in contact with the air, but the phenomenon that I'm super interested in, um, and one that anybody who's a fan of the old Predator movies might appreciate, is that infrared radiation that you give off uh, is actually half of all the heat that your body is losing. And really, the heat your body's losing is what's driving your sense of comfort. And it's the thing that we're trying to manipulate by installing air conditioners and furnaces and heat pumps and heating systems in our buildings. And so if we understand that a large part of what we derive as our sensation of of thermal comfort is from this, what we call radiant heat transfer, we can start to think about how we don't need to just blow air into rooms and try and hit somewhat generic set points on our thermostats but rather think about how surfaces, which are the things that are exchanging with us in this radiant heat transfer domain, how those might be designed and engaged with uh, to rethink some of those systems that we sort of uh, default to when we design heating and cooling systems. Okay. Um, Now, I was wondering how much of this change do you think, for example, can come from retrofitting existing buildings or how much do we have to focus on what's being built right now going forward to actually achieve a bunch of these outcomes? Well, yeah, that, that is uh, a great question. And it really is the, the challenge, understanding just how much retrofitting is necessary. And as design working in the architecture school, the students are most excited to design their brand new tower and their new building. 
but uh, we are surrounded uh, and on campus as well, of course, uh, with buildings that are already existing and particularly thinking of the campus context, there's not a lot of buildings on campus that we are excited about tearing down anytime soon. And so there's a lot of places, especially in large cities where we have infrastructure that's both historical um, and also low performing. And so thinking about how we can retrofit those is very important, sort of understanding the scale of, of that task and the systems that we're designing then have to be thought about. So we're involved in, in one Department of Energy uh, project called Advanced Building Construction, which is specifically aimed at thinking of new technologies that are retrofitable uh, in buildings. And we're trying to drive some of these alternative frameworks, uh, in our case, thinking of how instead of just putting a window air conditioner in a room to blow cold air around, how we might just manage the humidity part of the air coming in through the window through a screen that allows more fresh air, but addresses that sort of classic problem in the New Jersey summer of it's not the heat, it's the humidity. <laughs> so I think um, retrofitting is, is certainly um, the big challenge that we face. Okay, and I know obviously your lab also focuses on geothermal energy, which I have to say that I was really excited to write about when I started covering the environment years ago. I was waiting for this magical large scale transformation, which I do not feel like has materialized. Um, so I want you to make the case why uh, this is, is part of the vanguard that will actually become mainstream going forward. At some point. Well, um, and this is something that can bring Jesse back into the conversation too. There are two very disparate types of geothermal energy when you say they were geothermal. Um, and in the space of buildings, the thing I think we all should appreciate about building energy is, in fact, it's kind of wimpy energy. All we're really trying to do is make rooms 70 degrees. We're not trying to generate electricity to make our rooms comfortable. Um, and that fact that it, I just need to make the room 70 degrees means that the ground outside is already pretty close to 70 degrees, much closer than the air in the winter. And so if we use what would otherwise be referred to as ground source heat pumps as a geothermal source of heat. This is an opportunity to dramatically increase the performance of how we bring that heat into the, bu the building. And so as Jesse mentioned, we're trying to electrify buildings and this is one pathway, but this is also the pathway that dramatically reduces the primary energy it takes to get that heat into the building and takes advantage of the fact that the heat we're putting in the building is kind of this wimpy 70 degree heat that we need. It's not a flame running an, in, an engine, um, right? And, and on the other side though, there are ways to drill very deep wells to actually get temperatures that are warm enough to drive generators and turbines to make electricity. And so in these enhanced geothermal systems, we can actually make electricity and Jesse's working with a startup thinking about how to optimize those systems because the nice thing about the geothermal electricity generation is there are ways to think about how you can make that a slightly more stable base load through storage in the geothermal system. The sun and the wind uh, blow and shine on their own time scale. Um, and so having some sort of renewable base load that can be a little bit more flexible is super important. So on the electricity generation side, we're talking about wells that are on the order of kilometers deep. And for your home, many people in Princeton are installing geothermal and we're drilling right now thousands of 800 foot wells for campus. And they're 800 feet deep and those are bringing heat into the building. So one of the challenges with the geothermal is number one, it's these two different areas. And then number two, you never get to see it. And it's exactly when you're trying to write about it, it's this thing buried in the ground and there are different ways that the operations increase the performance of buildings or electricity systems. And so it can be uh, a challenge to communicate it, but it is one of uh, the, the biggest opportunities we have um, to expand both renewable generation and building energy efficiency. Got it. Um, I wanna touch on, on what's happened in terms of the pandemic where obviously people have been scrambling to change their indoor ventilation and what that means. Uh, in terms of energy use. And obviously I know you've recently published findings on this. Could you talk about what's, what's just happened and, and what implications that has? Yeah, so it, it really yeah, so is on the point uh, I've been making pre-pandemic about you know making people comfortable, not rooms. And we've been arguing that we should be thinking about air not being for heating and cooling, but being first and foremost for breathing. Um, we tend to blow air around buildings, even though it's 4,000 times more volume per unit energy than if I plumb and pipe water around to systems and buildings. 
And now what's happened is with COVID, we've decided that, or so historically we recirculate the air in the building to keep the buildings efficient. Because if I just bring in all the air I need to heat the building, then I got to heat up all that air from zero degrees in the winter, all the way up to 70 degrees. And so instead of heating all the air up, I send about 90% of it back through the system. And the recommendation and guidelines during COVID was to basically maximize the amount of fresh air. So instead of recirculating 90%, we started blowing in 90%. And what we found is that that results in more than doubling the amount of energy it takes to heat our buildings in winter or cool them and dehumidify them in summer. And that's a little bit scary considering how much we've celebrated 10% and 20% energy efficiency gains over the years in buildings. Um, so it's an opportunity to start to rethink, I think, some of those paradigms around uh, focusing sol solely on air-based systems. Um, and again, driving toward rethinking the paradigm that we use for, for delivering heating and cooling and focusing on how we bring air in in a way that's, that's safe and, and efficient. So there are ways to recover the energy as it leaves the building, which we have installed in many of Princeton's buildings. But those types of technologies uh, need to be deployed much more if we're able to maintain higher levels of fresh air ventilation without having extensive energy costs. And so we're big advocates for wherever you can, thinking about where natural ventilation, just opening windows. I mean, this is something I frequently hear people complain about buildings that don't have operable windows. Um, and I think it's something working in the architecture school that moving forward, many, many more buildings are going to be much more porous in a good way for natural ventilation, but it's something we have to start thinking about how the systems change in order to, to really uh, leverage that uh, as much as we can in terms of energy efficiency. That's the real challenge. Thanks so much, Forrest. Thanks. Next, dire I appreciate it. Next uh, director of the Office of Sustainability, Shauna Weber will show us how uh, Princeton is weaving all of this research together, both pedagogically and practically. But first, a video about Princeton's gray water systems. We'll be back soon. So below us is a 12,000 gallon holding tank. The university's new goal is to reduce absolute campus water usage by 26% by 2046, even while it grows. Princeton can serve as a test bed for both infrastructure decisions and personal scale behavior changes that help accelerate action around the country and the world. We're visiting today with Paul Larzalier from Princeton Facilities to talk about one of these projects. Storm water is basically your rainwater. Any rainwater that accumulates through this field will drain to this, this is a low point, it'll drain to this system. This will actually gravity feed into our tank. Uh, the gray water system is used for flushing of the toilets. The use of it is that you're not paying for city water. It's saving, it's helping the environment and you're also not wasting water and you're saving a lot of money because this is a very large building with a lot of bathrooms. This building was built in 2013 until now, we've never run out of water in those tanks. We've always used the gray water system and it, it had to save thousands of dollars. We did not have a gray water system collection here. This water would end up down in Lake Carnegie. That's where all the storm water will, goes if you don't have the gray water system. Hello, everybody. Um, I think we're experiencing a few technical difficulties. Um, so uh, I'm Shauna Weber. I direct the Office of Sustainability at Princeton and um, am delighted to be here. So um, I can start with an, um, just a few observations of um, how a lot of these ideas are, are knitting together. Um, oh, hey, Juliet. All right, I'm gonna skip that headphones. Where do we stand now? <laughs> I, I just introduced myself, so over to you. <laughs> Excellent, <laughs> thanks so much. Um, all right, uh, I wanna talk to you about kind of obviously how, you're, how the research that we've been talking about matters uh, in the real world. And I thought we'd talk about reducing waste and behavioral strategies 
using those to achieve some of Princeton's sustainability goals. So can you describe what kind of techniques you've been trying and what's failed or what's succeeded? In the waste arena in particular? Why don't you, yeah, why don't we start with, with waste, but you can certainly talk about other, you know, other. Yeah, so um, it's, it, so the waste, the waste question, of course, is uh, a big one, right? And it touches many dimensions of our life and, um, and human systems around the planet, right? So um, there's waste in, in, in almost every sector. So in terms of global impact, um, what, what we really try to do is, is try to use um, the, the Princeton setting, right? It's, it's a little microcosm, right? Of, it, it, that reflects at the local level many of the processes that are uh, not working so well or are working well at, at a larger scale, right? So how does all of this manifest in a, in a locality like this? And how can we, because we're a teaching and research institution, how do we use that to learn um, and to be involved in, in bigger scale dialogue about what's possible? So as you can imagine, you know, on a college campus, there's, there's lots of, of opportunity to talk about waste, whether it's in um, building off of academic courses that look at agricultural issues and how does that manifest in terms of how we think about procuring food on campus. Um, we can talk about the, the sort of global conversations about recycling, Right? And, and the, how the markets have shifted so dramatically over the last five years and, and have conversations about, okay, well, what innovation does that spark? And how can we start to think about campus systems differently to, to help accelerate that innovation? So if we're bringing in a bunch of single-use disposable plastics, um, that's a representation of a behavior that's happening at a much larger scale. And if we can figure out how to put the, the um, technology pieces with the procurement pieces and meaning what we buy, what, what comes in has to go out. So how do we match all of thing, these things up and, and also figure out how to manage it from an operational standpoint? And then the behavioral piece, right? So that's the hardest, that's the challenging part. But in all of these conversations, there's the human behavior piece. Um, when there's a technological solution, there also has to be a behavioral solution that happens in tandem so that that technology can actually be used most effectively. So there's lots of tinkering going on on the campus with different systems. And I'd say where we're not doing the um, super well, and, and then I'll, I'll give you an example of where we are doing well, um, is, sure. is that personal, like the personal scale desk side recycling kind of conundrum. Vast confusion about what's recyclable, what's not. Markets changing constantly. So something that might actually have a value on the market one week doesn't the next. So there's communications challenges. Um, so that area is represents only a small percentage of the actual volume of waste streams on the campus or in any community. However, it's the most visible and it's the one that you and I interact with as individuals. So it's important as a, as a, um, as a behavioral norm setting activity. Um, so, so we've got a lot of work to do there and so, so does everybody. So, I mean, we're not alone in being challenged by this. Uh, one place that another place that we're doing very well with is very much behind the scenes, so not very visible. So if you think about the amount of construction that's happening on college campuses everywhere and a lot of construction going on, on the Princeton campus, there's a very high volume of, of heavy types of, of waste um, associated with construction. And we have a very, very robust construction and demolition debris recycling program that's actually award-winning and that's big volume, big, heavy stuff. So we've learned a lot and are doing pretty well on that one. Interesting. And then in terms of, you know, I was just talking to Forrest about how the pandemic 
has obviously it's it's changed what's happened with you know heating and cooling systems and with again at the expense in many ways right of efforts to curb greenhouse gas emissions are when you look at how the pandemic has affected Princeton sustainability efforts what would you say are you know some of the top things it, yeah, it maybe potentially yeah. pro and con potentially yeah. Yeah, so the big con is exactly as Forrest was suggesting that that we have this challenge to look at where we've been working really hard on energy efficiency on the existing campus and thinking about how to make new buildings as energy efficient as possible. Yet when you throw a wrench in the works, like having to circulate air through the buildings more and more and therefore condition that those spaces more and more, um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a huge uptick in energy use. Um, and this is the, everyone's dealing with this. So, um, that's, that's the number one, like worry about the effects of COVID is, are we going to be able to go back, like reset to pre COVID conditions, or are there going to be health requirements that, that, um, mean we continue to circulate, um, uh, air through buildings more frequently. So we have to, we have to figure that out. And so, you know, based on, Forrest and other researchers were hoping to see some innovation come out of that, that we can apply. On the good side, um, of course, travel was way down, which is a high carbon intensive activity. So what can we learn from that? We've all gotten very used to this format. So what's the hybrid that might, where we might emerge actually on, on better footing, where we travel when we need to, but but really minimize it if it's not necessary, um, given how easy this format has become for many of us. So those are two things that I would mention. Okay. And I want to bring up the issue of divestment because it comes up really honestly every time yeah. I, I speak, whether it's at Princeton or at another college. Uh, so what, g- give us a sense of this is something that obviously uh, Princeton's grappling with. How, how are you dealing with this and, and talk through the decision-making process on that? Yeah, so um, like I think on many campuses, there's the, a pretty robust review process institutionally for, for considering divestment issues. And, and this has certainly risen to the top in terms of um, um, uh, something that's being very rigorously um, evaluated by the institution. And I know that there are recommendations that are coming from that process very soon. Uh, next month for Princeton. And I don't know what those recommendations are uh, right now, but it's the culmination of this deliberation process um, that includes input from from students um, and faculty and staff. So uh, one thing that I do and I take very seriously in my role is to help to foster dialogue. So here we are, an institution of higher education that is very committed to, um, to debate and civil discourse. And, uh, and I'm very supportive. You know, we have to think about these issues holistically across the entire human endeavor. And how we do that is uh, very complex. So having the deliberate debate and um, and digging into it is what we do really well. So I'm looking forward to seeing the, the culmination of the process, or at least this phase of the, of the deliberation process. And at the end of the day, who makes the ultimate decision about whether Princeton will continue to invest in fossil fuels? Is it, is it a combination of the board and the president or how, how just briefly, who, who um, makes my, that? My understanding is that it's the board of trustees that is the ultimate decision maker on this this particular issue. That's my understanding. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much, Shana. And please stay where you are because after this break, we will bring all of today's faculty members and forward thinkers back to have a lively discussion. While they get ready to come back, let's watch one more video. This one is about the infrastructure development process on campus and how environmental concerns and targets lie at the center of it. Princeton has been challenging itself to really push how we do integrative design at the university. So we want to look at the building as a whole, almost as an organism, and optimize it in relationship to all of its moving parts.
sustainability shouldn't be an add-on. It should be integrated throughout the entire thought process of design of buildings and everything we do, really. And I think that's what our sustainability plan is striving for. So at a very simple level, we have a series of metrics revolving around water, energy, stormwater, waste, transportation that we take into account in everything we do. But then all of those impact indicators are bracketed by this notion of um, really supporting a sustainability ethos. So what is it that we can do that doesn't just do everything behind the scenes on a technology standpoint, but really start to engage the users on how to be more responsible in the spaces. Uh, We have to start exploring what opportunities there are out there relative to, to behavior. I use the analogy of the difference between energy efficiency and energy conservation. Energy efficiency is building a better elevator. Energy conservation is encouraging people to use the stairs. environment to the building. Yeah, and I would add to that, one of the things we're focused on is increasing the community culture. When doing that, we were able to also add the benefit of improving natural ventilation by having the operable windows aided in the fact that we're going to be able to naturally uh, move airflow from the occupied spaces through the building because it's more of a community as opposed to isolated dorm rooms. And then the more nitty gritty of what we're doing, um, the building is located across the street from our plant. And so we're taking advantage of Um, excess of water that's being blown down in our cooling towers and piping it across the street and using it to flush toilets. So we are using non-potable water um, in a way that is beneficial and will save a couple million gallons of domestic water a year in the building. The Office of Sustainability is also really good at pushing us to how do we learn from what we're doing in a way that's not just scalable and repeatable across our projects, but how that knowledge can be leveraged with our peers as well. Well, we're, we're moving towards carbon neutrality. I mean, uh, if we continue on the path that we were on, and I say we as a, a, a larger we, the industry, um, we're going to quickly pass the point of no return relative to carbon consumption. Um, so we can't continue to use that mentality. We can't continue to use the same thought process that got us into this mess. Sustainability shouldn't be something in isolation. It needs to be in the ethos and the thinking of everything we're doing. Welcome back. I'm now going to pull on some of the questions that we've been getting from folks, as well as post some of my own to uh, bring us together and, and talk about some different issues. Uh, I do want to take uh, Michael McCracken, who's class of 64, uh, someone I imagine uh, folks, some folks watching might be familiar with, uh, poses a couple of questions to Jesse, but I think uh, you know broadly the panelists can talk about this, which is that um, the official IPCC definition of net zero only includes emissions uh, of the most important greenhouse gas uh, gases resulting from human activities. One one technical question, first off, is does the net zeros that needs to be achieved by 2050 and the studies being discussed also account for the effects of human-induced warning, warmings or increased emissions? In other words, like, you know, one is, are you looking at some of those feedback effects? And so briefly, um, yeah. Jesse, if you yeah. could about that, and then there's a broader question. So uh, in, in our study, at least, we defined it as um, net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases from human activities, as well as land use changes that affect carbon uptake in soils and um, agricultural systems, forests, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, in a business as usual world, those land carbon sinks are also declining in the United States. And we could reverse and protect, you know, both protect and enhance, expand those carbon sinks. And that's an important piece of the puzzle as well. And, uh, you know, non CO 2 greenhouse gases like methane, um, which comes from both uh, oil and gas sector uh, and coal, as well as agricultural activities is an important and potent greenhouse gas. 
as are nitrous oxides, also primarily from agriculture, black carbon, uh, refrigerants that you're trying to phase out under the Montreal Protocol and Kigali Amendment. So there's a whole range of, of important greenhouse gases beyond carbon dioxide, as well as the impacts of the land carbon sink that we have to attend to as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, thank you. And then the broader question that uh, that Mike also asked, which uh, I thought would be interesting, is you know he essentially questions why you know net zero by 2050 is you know an acceptable goal noting that you know there's questions of whether it's even compatible with the international objectives of limiting climate change to and global warming to less than two degrees celsius mm -hmm. much less keeping warming to 1.5 degrees celsius which is technically the level that international leaders have agreed to and so I think one of the, you know, questions that obviously I'm sure as researchers, and Shana, as, you know, as someone who's a practitioner deal with is the question of, you know, are the targets the right targets? Is this, you know, are, we're trying to deal with both what's achievable, but also what is scientifically mandated. And so I'm curious of where you all fall in terms of whether, you know, the the, the current aim is, is really something that, that adheres to the science, but also can be achievable. And how, how do you kind of balance those competing imperatives? So, anyone? so yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start on the sort of the Net Zero America study. I mean, we so the the Paris agreements, um, the international community committed to trying to hold global warming to well below two degrees Celsius is the phrasing in the, the um, agreement. And if possible, one point five degrees, which is sort of the stretch goal. Um, if you look at the timelines required for global greenhouse gas emissions to reach net zero consistent with either of those thresholds, uh, we would need the globe to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by about mid-century, depending on you know the the um, climate feedbacks that you know and the uncertainty around those um, uh, to re to get uh, to keep uh, global warming to 1.5 C with overshoot. So meaning we would go beyond 1.5 C and come back to that level later by drawing down. Uh, greenhouse gas levels with negative emissions later in the century. To stay below two degrees Celsius, we would need to reach net zero globally sometime between 2060 and 2080 uh, is the, where the bulk of the scenarios fall. So the question then is, how do we translate that into a target for an individual country, which doesn't, of course, control all global emissions, and in particular for a country like the United States? And I would argue that you know, we have both the technological means and the wealth um, and arguably a moral responsibility given our cumulative emissions, our contribution to cumulative emissions has been the greatest in the world uh, to lead that transition. And so you could say that if we get to net zero by 2050, that may be consistent with 1.5 degrees goal if everyone else also does at the same time. But the more likely scenario is that a net, a net zero goal by 2050 would be more consistent with a two degrees uh, outcome than 1.5. And I think the, you know, the real challenge, you, you know, you think about there is no scientific law that says 1.5 degrees or some round number like that really means anything, right? That it's a continuum and there are various feedbacks and nonlinear effects that we need to take account of. But anytime you hear a round number like 50% by 2050 or, you know, two degrees Celsius, you know, that's a politically derived convenient symbol. And the real goal, what the science is telling us, is to get global greenhouse gas emissions to net zero as rapidly as possible. And it's the as rapidly as possible part that we all need to work on. That's the part where all of our work is contributing to trying to do that faster. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll add to that, that, that the, the early action piece is critical. So if you look at the campus scale, right, we, we have a campus goal, right, because we're trying to reflect what is needed at a larger scale. Um, but to get there, even though our goal is 2046, which is, a, to Jesse's point, a politically convenient time is it's the 300th anniversary of the institution. So it's a meaningful date to the institution. And so that was very deliberate to tie it to that. Um, and it's slightly before mid-century. But the point is that the actions we're taking today are setting us up for the possibility of even of getting there. And if we don't take the actions today, it becomes vanishingly more uh, difficult to achieve a 2046 goal. So we're trying to really push that early action um, uh, point of view. I think it's similar when it comes to uh, industry as well. So um, in terms of the reports, they have like a 1.5 degree um, uh, aim and based on that they talk about you know what kind of uh, 
things do we need to use now, like carbon capture and storage for cements? Um, how much is that going to reduce CO2 emissions as a function of uh, years? And so it has to start happening now in the cement industry if that's going to also, um, you know, as one industry meet their target. Um, and so it's, it's really imperative that change starts happening now. All right. And Forrest, is there anything that you- I would just, uh, I would add on that the challenge lies partially in the fact that there's so much uncertainty and Jesse does such a wonderful job of giving us clear targets, but there's so much uncertainty built into the system. And I'm the, and Claire arguably too, uh, we like to argue that maybe there's gonna be some game changing moments and we hope there are too. So I always just like to throw that in there that hopefully maybe we invent a new geothermal system that sequesters CO2 while it takes heat out of the ground. That would be great. It doesn't exist now, but there would be some you know, new synergies down the road. And so I'm an optimist. So I hope that we can also innovate and maybe generate alternative pathways. <laughs> yeah, it'd be nice to get a couple of good breaks every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a really hard for you to model, right? So it's, yeah. Got it. Um, and Claire, you got a, a question that I think is really interesting. One thing that has been interesting for me as someone who, again, is largely focused on what's happening nationally is to see, frankly, how New Jersey, which I consider my adopted home state, given that I come from the District of Columbia, which still does not have full voting rights and statehood, uh, is that New Jersey really has been in the vanguard of some of the questions on procurement and, and just a range of environmental policies in recent years. And so when I'm, you were asked what you think of the current low carbon concrete, uh, concrete bills in New Jersey, I guess one for state purchasing, which is based on a, a New York bill and is getting a lot of press because of an innovative discount mechanism, uh, which I assume is, is a reference to economics that we have to get into a little bit, um, which incentivizes innovation. And then another is about low carbon pavers and blocks. So I was wondering if maybe you could talk either, you know, a little bit about what's happening in New Jersey, but broadly, you know, procurement as a, as a driver on chickaloo. Yeah, I mean, that's that's really important. <laughs> down to concrete, um, it's a dirt cheap material. So uh, in terms of innovating with uh, sustainability in the realm of concrete, um, if there's no uh, incentive, say, from a, a sustainability viewpoint and reduce CO2 emissions, um, it's going to be very hard to get innovative solutions um, out into industry, for example. So uh, with the, the New Jersey um, side of things where they're giving um, uh, uh, essentially reduction for uh, a bid um, based on the sustainability of the concrete that then allows for um, slightly more expensive types of concrete that are more sustainable for the environment to make inroads to be used. Um, and I, I think that's very important as we move forward. I mean, I have an analogy um, for when it comes to concrete with uh, solar, for example. Solar cells have been around for decades. They were quite expensive at the beginning, very expensive. Um, so if, we, if it was costing that amount nowadays, we wouldn't be able to use solar because it was so expensive. Um, so there needs to be help along the way as uh, we uh, want to use more sustainable types of concrete to overcome this initial uh, cost barrier. Um, or hurdle that does exist. And so what New Jersey um, is implementing um, is one step in the right direction so that we can um, bring in, although it's slightly more expensive to begin with, um, uh, more sustainable alternatives. Yeah, just to add that. And just to add yeah, to that, yeah. I mean, this is that is such a critical point that Claire is making, particularly in most of the, I mean, both in, in cement and in energy, where we're talking about commodity products, right? So you know, a kilowatt hour is a kilowatt hour, right? Uh, you know, a ton of cement is a ton of cement. It's not like an iPhone or, you know, a, a smart panel, you know, a flat panel TV where there are, you know, differentiated features that allow you to command a premium price when that product comes to market initially. You have early adopters that are willing to pay a lot for that initial product. And then you, that helps you with your business model to scale up the technology and drive it down in price and open up the market over time. For commodities like cement or energy, we have to have policy that does that, that creates niche markets, 
where early stage technologies can can come into the market and uh, and be sheltered to some degree from market competition for the mature technologies. And if we don't do that, you know, there's a lot of argument about that's picking winners and losers. Um, you might hear from more conservative minded um, folks about the role of government. But the reality is, if you look at the history of American innovation, that's how we do innovation. It's not about picking winners. It's about creating an opportunity for technologies to win. And if you don't do that, you are picking a winner. And that winner is the incumbent, right? The, and, you know, basic conventional commodity cement or fossil fired power plants, um, because they have such an incumbent advantage built on 100 years of, you know, scale and innovation and history that you cannot overcome that in a commodity market without policy support. And so New Jersey policies help do that, you know, California with zero emissions vehicles and other things. And the federal um, federal government is planning to do a lot of that under the Biden administration. Um, they've talked a lot about using federal procurement as a as a policy lever, and it, it really is a powerful one if we do it right. And Shauna, I was actually curious of whether there's example of Princeton obviously has been leveraging its own procurement power. Is is there an instance, I get the sense from Forrest again, your shameless uh, geothermal boosters. So maybe the geothermal industry has taken, has gotten a boost from you. But anyway, are there are there ways in which you've actually seen how you've been able to affect the, trans the, the supply chain? Yeah, so, so these are really active conversations in the, in the, um, the current construction efforts on campus. So how, how do we take um, the really carbon intensive building materials um, that we are going to be using and use, use ourselves, you know, position ourselves as a customer looking for lower carbon alternatives, whether it's structural steel or concrete, um, or healthier materials um, in, in the interior of the buildings. So it's, we're really trying to, to leverage um, ourselves in that respect and, and send a really strong signal to the marketplace that we are looking to uh, be a partner in using, using best practices, but also innovating. So yeah. that's, that's pretty exciting, actually. Yeah, and then and then yeah. Shauna facilitates me coming on site when there's real projects going on and challenging the people in practice to do better because I, I'm researching the newest and most exciting way to do it, but the standards aren't necessarily in place and all the levers haven't been pulled uh, to bring to market. But making that connection is something that I think Princeton does uniquely uh, between facilities and capital projects actually engaging in faculty research. Yeah, and I, I'll yeah. add to that 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 you know just as Forrest said, same thing with with. So Forrest's work and Claire's work and Jesse's work are all like uh, in, in inspiring <laughs> us to try to close the gap, right? So there's a big gap between what's actually readily available in the market and what our researchers are showing is possible. And we wanna take those first steps in closing that gap so that five, 10, 15 years from now, we're much closer to what's being seen uh, experimentally right now. And I wanted to close, we only have time for one more question about a question having to do with equity and kind of the question that Jesse alluded, the, the winners and losers in this transition. And so, for example, I was interested in the net zero report that, for example, that, you know, that you identify that worker, there are workers in, say, Louisiana and West Virginia that, you know, obviously will, would not fare as well under almost any pathway that we take to net zero by 2050. And then more broadly, all of you are working in areas where you're trying to push the envelope and that they're both folks who might be either affected by a transition away from carbon intensive you know, products, but also who have not been able to take it or might be less positioned to take advantage of learning. Any of you kind of speak to how you can try to incorporate those considerations as we make this transition? Yeah, I'll be able to start at the macro level in, in, in the Netzer America study. I mean, this the, the fact that it is now an affordable opportunity to transition to net zero. I mean, it's not saying it's not going to have no cost, right? Doing nothing has, is going to be cheaper than transitioning to clean energy, at least if you don't account all the damages that our business as usual system does, to, you know, in terms of public health and climate change. Um, but, it, you know, it's not going to break the bank. It doesn't require a World War II style mobilization of, you know, 20 percent of our GDP to build a net zero economy. Uh, we can do it uh, for reasonable expenditure. Then the question really comes down to, OK, how are we going to structure this transition in a way that delivers real tangible benefits to people, 
so that it, we can sustain a social license or social compact or whatever, you know, social contract, whatever you want to call it, for the large scale transformation of our energy system that we have to make. And so these sort of equity concerns aren't just a normative goal, right, that we need, you know, we want to have an equitable transition and a more, a more just energy system. I'd argue they're also a pragmatic goal. Because if we can't deliver real tangible benefits to to people, um, whether that's employment or reductions in air pollution or replacement of lost tax revenue to keep a county going or whatever the benefits are, uh, new industries that can grow in different communities, um, we're not going to sustain that kind of support for the scale and scope of the transition. We'll get to net zero eventually, but not on the timeframes that we're talking about. Um, and you need to avoid causing concentrated harms that, lead, you know, that further injustice or you're not you're going to, you know, the wheels are going to come off the off the, the vehicle on our way. Um, so I do think it's a really important concern. And it's one that we're, we're much more focused on in my in my research and in our group um, more recently is not just looking at the least cost solution. Right. I do cost optimization modeling for most of my work. It tells me what the lowest cost strategy is. But I've yet to find a politician who wants to know what the lowest cost strategy is. They want to know what an affordable thing is, right? But they want to know the benefits to them and to their constituents and to their kids. And, you know, that's how we all think. We sort of satisfy us on the budget part, but we think about a lot of other dimensions. And so we need to, as researchers to attend to those dimensions too, because that's what the decisions will be made based on. So I think it's a really important set of concerns, both from a normative goal and a set of pragmatic concerns. And researchers can contribute a lot uh, to understanding those impacts. Yeah. yeah and, and down at the scale of the individual person, those sort of pointing at areas that might be impacted. Within that, though, the sectors and the areas that will be invested in in terms of infrastructure actually uh, present opportunities where things like retrofitting buildings that we talked about earlier can be effectively deployed toward those communities that might be in need more of those, those benefits. And often many of the retrofit, simple things are retrofit buildings can be some of the fastest paying back and can be also the things that uh, disaffected communities need the most. So uh, I've worked with Isles in Trenton in the past. They're doing all kinds of retrofits uh, on buildings there, helping uh, low-income communities, you know, realize significant lowering of cost in their buildings while also then increasing the sustainability of the amount of reducing the energy consumption and carbon. I think Thinking about how maybe in this infrastructure plan, maybe not in the current Biden one immediately, but at least as it gets deployed this, at the level of the community, as money gets distributed, we should be thinking about ways to try and address how that dis the disproportionate distribution yeah. of those resources comes about. And I know, I know, like two examples: electric car and solar panels. Um, uh, we've talked with Ralph Izzo of PSENG many times about how those incentives are in some ways retrograde taxes where the median income of the person with the electric car and the solar panel is much higher than the average person, yet they're receiving tax breaks. And so thinking about how when we invest in buildings, we might be able to kind of do the opposite and invest more in communities that really need it. I think there's a huge opportunity there. Got it. Well, thanks so much to everyone who's here with me and everyone at home for listening to this conversation. We really appreciate it. And I've learned a lot. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, it's a Thank pleasure. You so thanks. Much. Yes. Thanks, Thank guys. you so much for engaging all. in this Forward Fest. In just a moment, we'll broadcast Princeton, a half century at the environmental forefront, an 11 minute video tracing the university's legacy of personal commitment, intellectual leadership, perseverance, and innovation across the spectrum of environmental issues facing our planet and humanity today. Be sure to keep the conversation going on social media with hashtag Princeton Forward. And visit forwardthinking.princeton.edu to access more forward thinking content, including a downloadable resource guide for this month's Forward Fest that will help you dive deeper into all of these issues. Again, we're so glad you've been part of Forward Fest with us. Until next time, keep up the forward thinking. Ten, nine, ignition sequence starts. Six, five, three, two. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11.